Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris Santamassimo from Santamassimo Davis, Southside General Counsel Solutions. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar, which is about managing employee risk as your company pivots back from COVID-19. Uh, I think as everybody can agree, this is certainly the topic of the day. We've been dealing with uh, this pandemic now for more than a year. Um, we've been in a situation as employers in which we're trying to balance uh, business needs and the ability to uh, keep the business uh, moving forward and continuing with uh, the very important uh, you know, topic of managing employee safety and keeping our workforce safe and engaged and, and, and healthy, uh, most importantly. So over the course of the last year, uh, there have been a lot of new roles that have evolved you know, in terms of how do we manage our workforces in the middle of the pandemic and how, to, how do we keep them safe you know, and as we start to turn a corner now, thanks to the vaccines uh, that have been released, um, we, we have a new one now from Johnson & Johnson. You know, as more and more people get vaccinated and uh, states begin to reopen and businesses get back to work, you know, the question that an employer should be asking, I think, is, you know, what does the future hold for us? Uh, how do we manage our business? And that's really what we're going to talk about today is, what, you know, what are the, the ground rules that we follow? Uh, what should employers be thinking about as they inter interact with their employees and come up with their own uh, personal return to work plans. You know, and, and the reason I think that we want to be informed is that the rules, as I said, have changed quite a bit since last year. So, uh, you know, in terms of things that might have been improper or perhaps uh, okay to do in terms of how you manage your people and vice versa. So we want to be sure that everybody understands the rules of the road. So, what we're going to do uh, to, to kick off the discussion uh, is uh, just let you know a couple of uh, the ground rules for today. If you've got any questions that you want to raise during the course of the presentation, I'd invite you to put it up on the Q&A uh, or the chat that's uh, within the, uh, the Zoom software, uh, because quite often what we'll find is that there may be uh, the, the answer to your question may actually be covered later in the presentation. And I'll look at the, the chat at the end just to uh, see if there's any uh, remaining questions that haven't been answered. In addition, our team will give you a, a call, either a phone call or an email after the presentation to, to set uh, time to, to ask any follow-up questions that you may have had, things that you think of after the presentation or issues that you may not have felt comfortable with, uh, you know, raising in front of a group. So I'd like to uh, offer that time to everybody who attends today at no charge, of course. So what, you know, our, our objective really is to keep you, you folks as informed as we possibly can and just share the benefit of the knowledge that we've accumulated. And the things that we'll talk about today really are the, the topics that we are dealing with our clients about on a daily basis. You know, clients that reach out to us with a lot of questions about, uh, you know, how, do, how should they proceed and how do they develop their own plans. These are sort of ripped from the headlines from those discussions. Let's take a look at the agenda for today's, uh, today's discussion. The first thing I want to mention is that to the extent that there's any folks in transition on the call today, you know, what we'd like to do is offer our help uh, in dealing with legal issues that you face either on a personal level or professional level. And we'd like to, to do as much as we can on a pro bono basis. You know, I think uh, we've seen a lot of great examples out there of folks that have really risen to the occasion to, to help one another. And we'd like to, to do a small part of that as well. So uh, if you've got questions that uh, are impacting you, uh, again, on personal issues or on professional issues, uh, reach out to us. We're happy to help any way that we possibly can. After that, I just want to tell you a little bit about the context uh, of where we're seeing uh, these questions. And then we'll talk about how to manage remote employees, handle plant shutdowns, develop your personal return to work plan, what is a safe workplace in terms of uh, all of the elements of testing, vaccines, personal protective equipment, et cetera. Liability issues that you'll face as, a, uh, as a, an employer and certainly within that context, we talk about whistleblower issues. And then lastly, oh, it's not the least important in the issues, maybe it should have gone up uh, at the top, but confidentiality and cybersecurity risks, which uh, I think we've all heard a lot about. And uh, thanks to uh, folks who are working in remote environments, uh, They've, we've seen a real uptick in the terms of uh, the number of phishing attempts, uh, malware uh, incidents, et cetera, that, uh, that are out there in the marketplace. So we want to make sure that everybody's sensitized to those issues. Just a little bit about our firm. Again, we are the outside general counsel for mid-cap companies. 
what we do is uh, offer some interesting uh, billing mechanisms to make our firm an outsourced law department for your company. So for mid cap companies that aren't large enough to hire their own general counsel and certainly not multiple lawyers that work only for them, uh, they sometimes experience an, a high hourly rates and maybe not the best service from dealing with attorneys who don't really understand their business and don't work uh, in a business friendly way. We are that uh, alternative. We have 15 lawyers on the team that again could be an outsourced law department. And what I mean by that is we can actually offer our services on a true fixed fee. So what really sets us apart from other other firms is the way that we go to market with a true fixed fee in addition to a teamwork approach that really leverages all of the skills from the 15 lawyers on our team. And what we find is that clients not only save money, but they experience a much better uh, service in terms of uh, getting advice that's not only friendly to business, but really contemplates uh, the full array of business issues that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And in the context of being an outsourced law department or an outside general counsel, we are asked to do uh, a lot of things that maybe are a little bit different from a typical lawyer. We're asked to weigh in on issues, help develop or turn to work plans and manage employment issues where we really partner directly with HR teams. So that's the type of things we're gonna talk about today. It's really the experience of, of uh, that role in rolling up our sleeves and coming up with this, uh, a business solution to these, uh, these problems and issues. What we'll talk about a couple times today is what is your personal objective? What does your company wanna do? What do you wanna achieve uh, in the coming months and years? And that really is gonna help sculpt what your particular plan is gonna be as you uh, decide to return to work. You know, what's good for one company is not necessarily good for the next because your objectives are different, your, your business model is different, and maybe your employee base is different as well. So what we wanna do is give you the rules of the road and the guidelines that you should think about as you construct your own plan. Um, I think it would be a mistake for uh, companies to rely upon all the chatter in the marketplace. Uh, you know, the, the kind of things that I've posted on this, on this particular slide are something that are much talked about. You know, flexibility has to be part of your plan in terms of offering a hybrid approach office versus work from home. Similarly, you know, uh, companies are looking at saving money by cutting the office footprint. That's a great discussion to have uh, at a context because sometimes when you put it in the context of your business operation, it doesn't necessarily work. Um, so what we hope is that you'll take away, you know, uh, some guidelines and some high points to help develop your own personal return to work plan, because it is not a homogenous thing. It's going to differ company to company. Uh, so don't follow what Google does or Apple does. Uh, although those seem to be the most talked about in the marketplace, let's figure out what's going to work for your particular company. So what do we know right now? Uh, it's been a difficult environment, not only as an attorney, but also as a, a business manager because uh, of, of the whole uh, array of things or the whole array of uh, executive orders and statutes and guidance uh, that's out there. And a lot of these, a lot of these uh, uh, sort of set, uh, elements really don't fit together so well. Um, you have a lot of uh, agencies that are giving guidance like the CDC and OSHA trying to tell employers what they should do or tell states what they should do. Uh, but state executive orders don't parrot uh, the federal guidance all the time. And they uh, and those orders, quite frankly, are different state to state. They're difficult to understand sometimes within a particular state. But then when you hear information about what's going on in New Jersey versus New York versus Montana, those things are not going to be the same. The standards that are applied are different. Uh, the terminology is different. And it's different not only state to state, as I said, but it doesn't necessarily link up with the with federal guidance. You know, for example, uh, many people on the phone have probably heard this this past uh, week, uh, the CDC issued guidance about uh, you know how uh, some of the some of the restrictions on fully vaccinated people could be lifted. Mask wearing wasn't as uh, uh, wasn't required in all circumstances, for example. But state executive orders don't necessarily. Uh, Keep, keep up with the same pace that the feds do. So we've had a, a, a sort of an onslaught of questions about what does that mean in New Jersey and New York and California and places where our clients are. Um, the answer, quite frankly, in many, in many instances like this week is that the states haven't spoken to it yet. So we don't even know exactly what that's gonna mean for a, a particular employer in a certain state. So besides the conflicts, we're dealing with a lot of complex information. There's medicine, there's science, and there's legal issues. Um, what we do know is that there's been quite a litigation uptick. Uh, 
there have been a number of cases uh, filed at the state level and some at the, at the federal level as well against employers. Uh, in many cases, they are uh, claims by, by employees who felt like they're in an unsafe work environment. In other cases, you see a lot of whistleblower claims, which we'll talk about later today. So what we do know also is that the pandemic is still here. You know, I, I remember back in March and April of last year where there was some optimistic uh, discussion about that it would be over by Easter and then be over by summertime. You know, we, we've sort of trudged on for the, the better part of a year after those things were said, and here we are still. As I said, we're turning the corner, but uh, there, we still have a ways to go before we can consider ourselves, you know, out of the woods on this thing. So there's still work to be done, but I do think it's the right time for uh, employers to be thinking about that return to work plan or a plan to get you back to what normalcy was before the pandemic. We've also been forced to make a lot of de decisions on an emergent basis. Um, you know, many companies had to pivot and, and uh, go 100% remote overnight. So I think you'd find many companies just have not really had policies catch up to uh, that, that emergent need. Uh, the decisions they made in March last year don't necessarily apply anymore or not really workable on the, in the long term. So again, that, that return to work plan is important now. And what we also don't know what the full uh, array of risk will be facing employers who do go back to the office. The liability picture is starting to develop a little bit and we'll talk about pieces of that, but the risk is still unknown in many respects. And then, you know, I, th I, th I think this last point is important that you know, the, there have been concerns uh, expressed about the vaccines. Um, the fact that it was, uh, the vaccines were approved under an emergency youth author authorization. There's a lot of political overlay around the, uh, the vaccination question. But I think what we're seeing is that's starting to get a little bit better too, as more and more uh, folks get vaccinated and do so successfully without any, uh, you know, without any uh, major, um, uh, you know, major reactions to it. So I think we're seeing a lot, that, I think that is starting to resolve itself. But again, there's still some uncertainty there. So with that background in mind, the first thing I'd like to talk about is remote employees. You know, you, you might think that this is old news now, but I think that uh, we, we need to consider uh, the work from home situation or the remote work situation, whatever you'd like to call it, because it, it could be uh, part of your return to work plan as you ease back into the office or as you uh, continue to allow your employees to work from home on an ongoing basis. So. The big question, I guess, is whether employers will embrace a work from home situation permanently. Uh, your guess is as good as mine, but I, but I do think it's going to vary by company. You know, your HR uh, professionals would say that you know recruiting uh, is uh, is not only uh, made a little bit more complex by this work from home situation, but the idea of whether your particular company will allow a, a hybrid work arrangement may uh, bleed over into your recruiting efforts because maybe employees are going to look for that. Again, as I'll say it a bunch of times more, but your plan has got to got to work for you, uh, and it's and you got to find the right balance. I do think you need to lead on the issue. Again, don't follow the big companies that are that are out there making uh, making waves or may, or issuing press releases about what they plan to do because those uh, those plans may not necessarily work for your companies. Um, an issue that comes up in, in practice quite a bit is this idea of managing performance. Uh, I've I've had dozens of uh, clients say, you know, I've got a, a particular employee who was, you know, f fine, maybe uh, maybe a little below average in the office, but now that we're in a work from home situation, uh, it looks like the performance is, is worse, performance isn't working, and I want to cancel that work from home arrangement and drag the person back into the office. What should I do? So what I've, I've said in every case is that the employer needs to manage uh, performance separately from the idea of whether they can work from home manage that employee just as if they were in the office. Uh, put them on a performance improvement plan or do what you can to, to retrain or train or somehow you know, manage performance, but don't use the work, from home, uh, the work from home ability as some sort of carrot and stick where you're gonna pull it back if somebody's not performing. Deal with the performance issue, uh, handle it one way or another, uh, and then move on but, but don't, uh, don't necessarily use work from home as, uh, as the, the hammer and the, uh, and the carrot. So deal with those things uh, separately. When you do allow uh, people to work from home, you have to, number one, determine who can work from home in an equitable fashion. So the, the, uh, the heading there is administer your work from home program in a non-discriminatory manner. What that means is apply universally to, uh, and uh, 
across your employee population based on objective criteria related to the job. Of course, uh, categories about race and gender, sexual orientation, and things of that nature cannot be, uh, to, you know, cannot be considered in, in determining who can work from home and who can't. As part of that, I think an employer has to be able to document and explain later how they made those decisions. If you've got a, a situation at your company in which you've allowed certain people to work from home and not others, we need to be able to explain how you made that determination. Uh, because what we don't want to do is be subject to a claim of discrimination and be unable to explain it later. Someone who, an employee who finds him or herself unable to work from home and can't explain why you did it and why you came to that conclusion may jump to a conclusion that uh, it was done in a, in a discriminatory way. So let's be prepared. So HR uh, and your management team should document those decisions and where there were emergency exceptions noted, make sure that those appear in your records as well. And if you, hopefully you've got a policy by now to, to let folks know what are the rules about working from home, where can they do it, where can't they do it. Um, so if you don't have a written policy already, you really should think about putting one together. If you had a policy about work from home that predated the pandemic, now's the time to be sure that it specifies uh, that it can be amended, that it reflects your current situation. Uh, and you should also let folks know that you can eliminate that policy or that work from home ability at any time, depending on the needs of the business. But now's the time to uh, now's the time to uh, start to shore up those written documents if you haven't already. So where can remote employees work? Um, you got to start uh, by knowing that the OSHA safety rules apply to remote workers. So the employer is under an obligation to make sure that the work uh, the work environment is still safe, whatever that means. Um, if, if you've got somebody working out of their house. You know, you, you've probably read articles and seen uh, reports about people that have, you know, pretty poor situations. They don't have uh, even a place to work, let alone ergonomic uh, chairs and desks and that sort of thing. So what we see is a lot of repetitive stress injuries and people that are generally uncomfortable working from home. But there is, but OSHA does generally require that it be a safe environment. Um, so the employer should do what it can, you know, uh, on balance to make sure that the, that it's as safe and productive an environment as possible. Also, remote workers are uh, covered by workers' compensation while they're working from home. So should they be injured in the course of their work or, or during the course of their work, uh, they're eligible for workers' compensation benefits. So keep that in mind. But perhaps most importantly, the, the employer can dictate where someone can work and the circumstances. For example, if you don't want your employees working at a Starbucks, or working at a diner or working in some other public place because you can, you're concerned about uh, confidential and proprietary information being exposed, that can certainly be part of your policy and part of uh, what you require your employees to do. Uh, also too, if you, want, if you want to make sure that your employees are productive, that they got appropriate childcare so they're not sort of splitting their time, uh, you know, uh, caring for children when they should be working, that can be part of your, uh, your policy as well. I will say though that um, what we want to do as employers is be as flexible as we possibly can, recognizing that not everyone is going to have the, the luxury to have child care, you know, from between nine and five every day because they've got kids uh, studying from home and maybe even uh, younger children who can't have access to, uh, to child care. So what I would tell you is as you, as you decide what works for you and, you and you decide individual cases is be as flexible as possible, sort of throw out, you know, these uh, maybe uh, old notions about when work should be performed. You know, for example, if someone could uh, perform work early in the morning and in the evening and allow themselves to be available for, ch for children studying at home during the day, you know, think about that as a, as a way to, you know, accommodate the, uh, the complexities of what the pandemic has sort of thrust upon us. So throw, I would throw out those age old, you know, conceptions about what, what's appropriate and what's not and when people need to be available and focus on making sure that the, the work gets done. So uh, when it comes to uh, taxes, an issue is, uh, is, has come up quite a, quite a bit. These taxes should be withheld. You know, for example, if you've got a New Jersey resident who works in New York City, uh, while they worked in New York uh, at, their, at their office, they likely had New York State taxes withheld from their paychecks. Now they're working from home at their house in New Jersey, which state taxes apply. So I, I think in general, what you well, first of all, it's it's really an accountant's uh, decision to make. But I think in general, what you'd find is that the location where they're performing the work is is going to dictate which state's taxes are are being withheld. 
the takeaway here is to make sure that you're taxing your employees appropriately, depending on where their where their local where their work location is, and uh, whether that's a permanent uh, solution or a temporary solution may weigh into that decision. The takeaway is make sure that you're taxing your people appropriately so that they're not jammed up on taxes at the end of the year. Home office expenses, number, number one, you ought to have a company policy about what uh, expenses are reimbursable and which ones can be charged to the company. What you'll find is that uh, California, by the way, has a, has a, a law, uh, not surprisingly on the issue, uh, California uh, residents are may be entitled to reimbursement for a pro rata share of their cell phone and internet usage that, that's attributed, attributed to their work. So that's right out of the box. So on top of whatever the state law requires, you'll also find, by the way, uh, statutes in uh, Illinois, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C. on that very topic as well. But a company policy that recognizes the applicable state law and also tells employees what's, uh, what's okay and what's not beyond that uh, is something you ought to have in writing. Uh, and then again, updating those policies to reflect this new, uh, this new remote work situation I tell clients too that their training uh, that they give employees needs to needs to reflect that you've got a lot of people working either 100% remote or in a hybrid uh, environment. So anti-harassment, uh, anti-harassment training, compliance training, and making sure that they've also got their reporting mechanisms that uh, work in a remote environment as well. You know, the idea of a suggestion box where you write a note on a piece of paper with a pen and drop it in a box probably is not going to work in a remote situation. So having electronic tools to do those things, I think is, is very important and something we ought to recognize. Just one uh, quick note that an interesting uh, subject has arisen in uh, this, this past year about nomad visas or digital nomad visas. This really reflects that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of folks can work almost anywhere as long as they've got an internet connection. And there's a number of countries uh, that have, have taken that as a, perhaps a way to supplement their, their economies by attracting you know, high wage earners to go work in their jurisdiction for an extended period of time. Um, whereas they normally would have had to get a, a work visa or you know, been there on a, on a tourist visa and probably violated the tourist visa if they'd worked while they were there. So last I checked, there were uh, seven countries, Barbados, Bermuda, and Anguilla, Estonia, Dubai, Georgia, and the Cayman Islands. That's Georgia, the country, not the state. And uh, there's a, a Aruba, Croatia, and Greece were about ready to issue some rules on nomad visas as well. So it's up to you to decide if you want your people working in these places or not. Uh, just because people want to go to the beach in, uh, in Bermuda and work there with their laptop doesn't mean that that necessarily works for your business. So again, have a policy on it, but recognize that some of your employees may be looking for this type of a situation. So it, it basically legalizes the status of these traveling workers so that they can do it for a longer period of time than they otherwise would have been able to do on a, on a tourist visa. So with remote employees, here, here are some uh, issues in terms of the how and how do you manage these folks. Um, the first issue is a Fair Labor Standards Act issue that uh, if you know your employees are working, uh, they're teleworking and they're performing uh, work uh, in excess of uh, eight hours a day or 40 hours a week, depending on the jurisdiction, if they're eligible for uh, for overtime, you have to pay them, even though it, even though uh, overtime might be in violation of your company policy. So the takeaway there is, it's okay to have a policy in place about overtime and off hours work, but you got to enforce it. However, if you know that an employee actually uh, did the work, whether or not they record the time, they should be paid for it, and then you can deal with them after the fact after you pay them. You can reprimand them for working the overtime and tell them not to do it in the future. Uh, and you can take further action if they continue to do it in violation of the policy, but you got to pay them. Um, you, and you can require time reporting as a policy for all employees, whether they're exempt or non-exempt. Um, there's a lot of systems out there probably provided by your payroll companies that will enable you to do that time reporting fairly, uh, fairly easily. But you can do it as simply as uh, requiring emails. You can have a call-in situation, whatever, whatever works for you, uh, you can require it for all employees. Um, this is another issue that's come up uh, recently. It's travel time on partial telework days. You know, uh, take for example, what uh, a situation where an employee drives to the office uh, to start a day at eight o'clock, works from eight to 12, and then leaves the office to come home and continue the day at home. Uh, during, that, during that drive home, uh, they stop at the grocery store and maybe a doctor's office for a, for a quick appointment and they arrive home and, and complete their day. 
the question that the IRS recently, or the, I'm sorry, the, the DOL recently answered was whether or not that time was compensable. And the, act, the, the answer is generally not. Unless they perform work while they're in the, uh, while they're commuting back home in that, in that example, uh, the travel time is not compensable. So it's just, uh, it's just free time. It's commuting time that otherwise wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be uh, reimbursable or compensable. Next, even though you have people working in a remote environment and working at home, remind employees that they're eligible to take their normal meal breaks and, and rest breaks. Um, I think what we've found, uh, despite the fact, that, the fact that people were a little suspicious about how these remote situations would work, what we're finding in general is that people are working more than they did in the office. Uh, they're starting earlier and they're working later and they're taking fewer breaks. So as an employer, do the right thing and remind your employees that they are eligible for their breaks. Uh, and again, this is where the flexibility comes in. Perhaps you'll let them uh, take time off during the day to, to do personal errands as long as they make up the time a little bit later too. And that goes hand in hand with the idea of when you take your breaks. Childcare and homeschooling issues is again, this, this, uh, this flexibility issue, but you can impose standards about what you expect um, in terms of whether there's childcare to watch young children uh, during the course of the day as people are working from home. So another issue that's come up in my practice a number of times is this idea of tracking remote workers and protecting uh, confidentiality. So what I've seen and heard is that, you know, we've, we've got some real issues about protection of proprietary information. People are now storing documents and data in their houses and their cars, places that they perhaps shouldn't. Uh, it's not just a digital issue, it's a paper issue as well, where people have got, you know, they're generating records, they're printing things on their home, home printers, and they're also exposing their, their screens and their materials to, the, to their other family members. You know, we've all seen the pictures of people working in their kitchens and their dining rooms and their living rooms and their, even their bedrooms. So um, I think what you need to do as an employer is make sure that you remind people about uh, the need to be conscious of their environment, to protect information from being disclosed just because the person that may see it as a family member doesn't mean it's okay to have it disclosed. So reminding people on a, on a pretty continuous basis that they need to protect company information, I think is very important. Um, and it's, and, and, and it does not sort of indicate you that you're distressful of people, distressful for, of people um, by giving them those reminders. Also too, backing up their information, backing up their data on whatever devices they're using uh, is an issue, is an issue perhaps for IT, but certainly an important one in my opinion, uh, and providing people with the proper tools to do that. Next question that's come up is, you know, can you monitor your remote employees? Uh, as, you, as I'm sure folks know, company issued laptops and iPads have a lot of capabilities to be managed uh, from a remote location, to turn on cameras, to install, uh, you know, uh, keyboard tracking devices, to know exactly what people are doing. Um, on a, on a minute by minute basis and whether they're working or not. I've also seen uh, software that my own kids have uh, used as they've taken remote college exams where their, their eye movements and their surroundings are, are tracked by the software to, you know, I guess, to ensure uh, that they're not cheating on the exams. But a lot of, a lot of capabilities and, and employees are asking, well, I wanna make sure that I'm getting the most out of these employees that I can, should I monitor my employees? The first question I ask is, you know, why are you doing that? Um, are you concerned generally, or do you have specific issues about a particular employee and whether they're being productive or not? Uh, so the why I think is really, really important. Um, if you if you even determine that you've got um, uh, that you've got a legitimate reason to to monitor employees, there's a lot to be concerned about here. Uh, number one is whether you're going to advise employees that you're doing it. Um, in my opinion, I, I I would tell you that. You should be advising your employees and your policy should, should uh, indicate whether you're going to uh, monitor your employees activities. Um, so, and, and this is nothing new, by the way, but I think the technology is such that there's a lot more, uh, a lot more options on how to do it. It's fine to Im impose uh, time clocks and making sure that people are working and maybe there's a way to, to see whether they're active on their computers or not. I think it's a very dangerous place as an employer to start activating people's cameras and watching them, especially when you consider where people are working uh, in these remote environments, because you may be capturing a lot of things that should be that legitimately should be private. And now we've blurred the, the, the difference between or the distinction between uh, the workplace and home. 
So I think activating cameras is difficult and dangerous and, and uh, not, not, not really what I would tend to advise. I would also ask you too, you know, in terms of tra uh, tracking people's keystrokes, I'm not sure that you're, I'm not sure that you're really gaining much from that uh, by doing it. Again, maybe you're tracking activity level, making your, maybe you're asking people to report in about when they're working. But the, the takeaway here is that there's a lot, there's a lot of options out there. Ask the why, make sure that people are advised about what you're going to do, that the policies reflect it, and that they're conscious about the fact that they're going to be monitored in some way before you actually implement it. Another issue that uh, maybe falls into this category too is the idea of recording meetings. You know, the meeting uh, that you may hold on Zoom or Teams or uh, WebEx can easily be recorded and stored in the cloud. If you're going to record meetings, the, first of all, people are people are generally not conscious of the fact that uh, the meeting is going to be uh, taped unless you tell them. Uh, people, I don't think that most of us come to the table thinking that every everything that we're doing on a video conference is going to be taped. So I would advise you to let people know you're going to get a tape before you do so. Next thing, it's a, it's an unfortunate consequence of what we're talking about here, but planned shutdowns could be part of your plan. Um, just want to talk a little bit about the terminology here uh, of layoffs versus furloughs. So when you shut a plant down permanently uh, and you shut the complete facility down, everybody gets laid off unless they're transferred to another location. So layoff is a permanent uh, is a permanent separation from the company. Furlough, on the other hand, is it's not really a statutory term, uh, but it's really understood to be a layoff without pay, but temporary in nature. And generally, benefits are paid during the the, the course of the furlough. Now, the, the, what is a furlough is often going to be defined by your benefits plan. So, before you use the term in any of your communications, you should check your benefits plans to see whether there is a definition there. But that's generally what it is. But a, but a furlough becomes a layoff generally after six months. So if you're gonna have somebody uh, out on the bench for more than six months, uh, they're gonna be considered lay, laid off, uh, certainly for the WARN Act, which we'll talk about in a, in a second. So whenever you decide to do a plant shutdown or a layoff or even a furlough, I would tell you that it's a risky situation uh, because you wanna make sure that you're conducting it uh, in, in, a, uh, in an objective way without reference to any improper uh, characterizations or categories of employees. So doing a disparate impact analysis, I think is really helpful or a risk analysis, just to determine who's impacted, why are the decisions made uh, and who's being included in the layoff or the furlough or the plan shutdown. I think it's really helpful to be able to, to sit down and, and, and sit down with your counsel, do that analysis and be able to explain all of your decisions later. And then in the course of that discussion, you may find that there's a couple of cases where there's some risk associated with it, you know, picking, Person A versus person B might have a, a risk associated because person A uh, maybe is a whistleblower or raised some concerns about treatment in the workplace or, or one of the many other things that uh, create some risk in the employment context. The takeaway is sit down with your counsel and really do that analysis, especially in this very tense environment to be sure that you can justify your terminations and who you selected later and be able to prove that your decisions were non-discriminatory. If you're if you're an employer that's covered by the WARN Act, that's a federal statute, by the way, uh, that basically uh, that basically requires certain employers uh, to uh, provide at least 60 days notice of, of mass layoffs or shutdowns or planned shutdowns. So basically, it's basically it's employees, uh, basically it's larger employees who have at least 50 employees within a 75 mile radius of where the layoff occurs. Um, and if you're if you find yourself in that place. Uh, you're going to have to give at least 60 days notice of, uh, of the layoff. Now, what we find too is that employers that have had layoffs over time may find themselves in a rolling reduction in force and trigger warrants somewhere along the way. So it's a little bit uh, fact specific, too fact specific for this webinar, but I want to alert people to the fact that if you've gone through a, a number of reductions in force over this last year, you may find yourself in a Warren Act trigger situation. So make sure that you're reviewing that with your HR team uh, and with your uh, with your counsel. Uh, by the way, some uh, some states have what are called mini warn laws. California, New Jersey being a couple of them. Um, those import those impose additional requirements on top of the federal statute. But what we've seen over the last year is that many of those mini warn statutes have been suspended uh, because of the pandemic, uh, because they wanted to alleviate the burden on employers to make quicker decisions about layoffs. So. 
Uh, California uh, was suspended. New Jersey was suspended as well. I suspect that they'll be reinstated at some point in the near future as more and more people get back to work, but it's suspended for the moment. But just keep in mind that they may apply to your particular state. Next thing is communications and documentation, which I think is super important uh, for the obvious reason that people uh, in your workforce that, that feel like they're being fully informed and have their questions answered are gonna be a, little, a lot happier about either continuing to work, going back to the workplace, or if they're unfortunately subject to a layoff or furlough, there'll be a greater level of understanding there. But for the folks that are coming back, I would invite a dialogue with your employees to express any concerns that they might have about a return to work situation. Because I think what we can all agree on is that it's not only a tense situation out there, um, for a lot of different reasons, but people are worried. I think there's, uh, in many cases, a lack of understanding about the science and the medicine and what does it mean to be vaccinated and are things getting better and all of these things. There's people very fearful about, uh, about the idea of returning to work. There's also people that have gotten comfortable with it, with their new environment, and, it, and you may find some reluctance to change. But invite the dialogue so people can express their concerns and you can evaluate those uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. Documenting what you did, by the way, as I said before, is really, really important, but this dialogue may result in employees requesting accommodations to continue working from home or work in some other hybrid environment, even though you're going to reopen your office. So have that dialogue and to the extent that people either refuse uh, to return to work or they demand an accommodation. What I would tell you to do is, is review that accommodation in very, uh, very much the same way you would invite a, or in review a, a request for a disability accommodation. So put it through your disability analysis. Um, in fact, that's, the, that's on our next slide, is if, if people return, if they refuse to return to work because of an, an issue, whether it's a generalized fear, fear or an actual uh, physical condition, or maybe it's something else, maybe it's uh, you know, with a family member that needs uh, additional assistance. To the extent that em employees refuse to return to work, um, I think you have to just go through that disability accommodation process have an interactive process with the employee, apply the same rules that you would apply if they claim to be disabled in some way or needed a disability accommodation. And quite frankly, I think you're gonna end up with a much better, uh, with a much better outcome because you'll be able to not only uh, address that particular concern head on, but you'll be able to uh, show that you did, uh, that you made a decision in a very contemplative way. And you also invited uh, the employee to get their treaters involved so that you can get doctor's notes and, and other justification for the, uh, uh, for the request. And you can also uh, document and support why you denied certain requests as well. So I would still encourage you to be flexible where you can, uh, but there's gonna be a number of requests for accommodations that simply don't work for you. Uh, and this is, the, this is the way to uh, handle them, process them and dismiss them uh, in, in, a, uh, in a thoughtful way. And this too, I think is, is if you don't have uh, um, a vendor that normally does your accommodations uh, analysis, this might be the time where you, get, where you get your attorneys involved to help weigh in on whether an, an accommodation request is, uh, is legitimate or not and whether it should be granted. So after all of that, if you've decided that it's time to return to work, um, here's, here's some of the things I wanna just uh, highlight for you. Part of the complexity is that those state and local requirements apply, uh, which I mentioned early on in the presentation. So, uh, you know, reading the CDC website uh, is not going to tell you everything you need to know about the requirements that you've got. And even looking in, in some cases, like in California, uh, there are not only state requirements, but there are county requirements and city requirements. And, there, and California is not the only state that's doing that. So as an employer, you need to be really sure uh, that you understand what the requirements are. I think uh, in large part, we're gonna cover uh, what you need uh, to be aware of and what you need to implement here. But I just want you to know that there are, there are several layers. It's not just a federal thing and, and in some cases, not just a state thing. But in general, what, uh, what you'd be required to do as an employer is implement the CDC's and OSHA's safety and hygiene practices. So as many of you know already, OSHA's uh, PPE rules basically leave that decision to the employer to determine what kind of PPE is required uh, in a given situation. So one size does not fit all. Now we've got this new uh, CDC guidance around uh, PPE because of COVID. So that's gonna overlay what you would normally do 
and to, deter to determine what kind of PPE your employees need. But again, it's going to be the employer's decision, but the employer needs to, to account for the CDC guidelines in this area. Uh, next is implementing a vaccination program. This uh, is probably the most asked question among uh, clients and, uh, and others that I've spoken to. You know, should we implement a mandatory vaccination program and require all of our employees to get vaccinated? And how do we do that? Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about the vaccination programs uh, later in the, in the presentation. But that, that uh, is probably one of the most uh, talked about things uh, on, going on at the moment. And then also to uh, testing in the workplace as well. You know, should we have a testing program for all of our employees before they're allowed to enter the workplace? Uh, having an anti-retaliation anti policy on the books is really, really important. Hopefully you've already got that in your employee handbook or your compliance handbook, but actually not only having a policy on the books, but actually living up to it is really important as well. And an anti-retaliation policy is an advisory to your employees to let them know uh, that they won't be retaliated for raising concerns and, and discussing uh, issues about uh, COVID in the workplace and that they won't uh, be fired. They won't be... Uh, you know, they won't be uh, demoted or anything of that nature when they do raise their hand. Each time you make a change, though, it's time for a risk assessment. Uh, and I'm not talking about bringing in accountants and, uh, and scores of attorneys to do it, but evaluating the, the fact that each change has some element of risk and be sure that you've accounted for it and you can, uh, and, and uh, you know, and, the, and the, the basically the change uh, makes sense uh, from a financial and a risk standpoint as you make that change. Having a written plan in place about what you do when someone tests positive for COVID uh, or there's a suspected case. We'll talk about those details in a minute. And, and it's all about understanding these new rules, as I said, because they are still evolving. You know, even though we're getting maybe to the final uh, leg of this uh, pandemic, at least for, the, at least for now, uh, the, the rules are gonna continue to evolve and change as, uh, as we see with CDC and others. So how do we protect employees and, and provide a safe workplace? Uh, the place you start from is what I said early on is that any policies that you have need to be non-discriminatory. Um, so they, they can't discriminate based on gender or race or religion, uh, sexual orientation and things of that nature. So they need to be neutral on all those issues. Following CDC guidelines in terms of hygiene, uh, you may think about temperature checks. CDC uh, guidance talks about temperature checks as being optional, but it is another way to make sure that folks that are, are symptomatic, don't enter your workplace. Uh, if you're going to have a temperature check, I would tell you that it should apply not only to employees, but also visitors. Uh, and, you know, the, the latest information we have on, uh, on COVID-19 suggests that the, the majority of folks who are symptomatic uh, uh, will run the temperature. So again, it's not 100%, but it is one more, uh, you know, it is one more clearance mechanism. Keeping people as separate as possible, at least six feet apart, is really important as well to prevent the spread if there is a, if there is a, a COVID-19 positive person in your workplace. So making sure that people are as, uh, at least six feet apart at all times is important. You know, whether that means they work in uh, private offices versus open areas, or whether you uh, stagger your workforce to ensure that people can stay separate in, in an environment where they would normally be shoulder to shoulder, very important as well. Cleaning, of course, is, uh, goes without saying. And the reason that we wanna, we wanna have these rules in place is to protect your companies from what are called rebuttable presumption laws. So what we've seen uh, in a number of states, some examples are California, Illinois, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, New Hampshire, Wyoming, and Wisconsin. Um, what, there are now laws on the books which uh, presume that an employee who, who is asked to work back in the office returns, re returns to work and gets sick can presume that they got sick because of being back in the office, unless the employer can rebut that presumption. So what does that mean? It means if an employee gets sick, they can, they can uh, be eligible for work as compensation and you know, claim against the employer for compensation, unless uh, the employer can show that it did everything it could to prevent uh, the spread in the, in the workplace and kept as clean a, a workplace as they possibly could. And what that means is following CDC guidance. So if you're doing all the right things in terms of separation and hygiene, uh, de-densifying your workplaces, you'll be able to rebut that presumption. You have to know that it applies. In some states, by the way, the, the rebuttable presumption only applies for first responders. Uh, but nevertheless, it is an issue that you're going to have to contend with 
either because of a rebuttable presumption law or because people may claim workers' compensation uh, benefits after they get sick. So do the right thing, follow the guidance, uh, and maintain as safe a workplace as you can, and you'll be in a pretty good, pretty good position uh, to, to defend those claims. Next is investigating complaints. You know, I mentioned whistleblower uh, concern earlier, and we'll talk about it again later in the presentation, but uh, an employer should, should take each and every complaint or expression of concern from employees and investigate it as fully as possible. What that means is listening to people, taking a report about what they, uh, what they raise as issues or what they complain about, documenting it in writing, running it down, understand whether it's, whether it's important or whether it's real, and then fixing it if it's something that needs fixing. And then lastly, hopefully uh, following up with people, who, with employees who raise those concerns so that, they, so that they know they were heard and that you've taken measures to address those issues. So that, you know, by doing this, by, by uh, aggressively, aggressively and carefully investigating these complaints, you're gonna minimize your whistleblower risk as a result. Here are the nuts and bolts about what you're, uh, what you need to be thinking about in terms of a safe workplace. As I said, PPE and making sure you have adequate supplies, minimize outside visitors for the time being. And I still think that applies, uh, at least for the time being, even though we've got vaccinations. You should absolutely require your employees to self-screen and document. You can ask them to document on a daily basis that they don't have symptoms, that they weren't exposed uh, to COVID-19 uh, positive people, et cetera but self-screening, but, but that means is if anybody has symptoms that are COVID-19 uh, related or not, if they have symptoms of illness, they should stay out of the workplace. Initiatives come up a couple of times, uh, clients have asked us whether employee testing is in order, meaning that should they, uh, should they require that employees be tested when they, when they come to the office or should be tested periodically. Um, I guess I would tell you that it, I wouldn't tell you not to do it, except for there, there's a cost associated with it for sure. Um, but it only, you know, a, a test result only gives you uh, some data about a particular moment in time. So if you ask people to, to go to a testing center on their way to work and get a rapid test, uh, you can't say that they won't be exposed on their way out of the testing center on their and on their way to the uh, the work uh, the work location or even at the work location. Uh, so I, I I guess there's some benefit there. Um, in most cases, I think that the, the idea of having a, a broad testing program is probably more expensive than it's worth, um, but it is permissible. So you as an employer can absolutely decide to, to test your employees as a condition uh, for coming to, coming to work. And if they refuse, uh, you, can keep, you can keep them out of the workplace. And then lastly, post, there's an OSHA poster out there that, and there's some state equivalents that advise employees of their rights. Uh, and then also talk about uh, also talk about uh, the, the measures that employees should follow uh, to prevent the spread of the virus. If you're going to uh, collect any medical records, by the way, uh, either temperature check records or self screening documentation, you're going to want to uh, maintain that separately from employment files. Don't don't file it within uh, within the normal personnel files. Uh, that's important as well for privacy's sake. I think I sort of jumped ahead on this, but uh, in terms of the workplace testing uh, issues, but just a couple of other uh, couple of other things that I didn't mention. There's some guidance out there that was issued on January 21st, uh, and testing is permitted as a condition for entering the workplace. So at least you've got uh, some legal guidance that supports your idea, uh, supports your your program to test. But the the question I would start with, and you know, why do something is certainly a uh, what we asked uh, when we looked at some issues earlier in the presentation, but ask why you're doing it. Um, you know, be sure that it's going to actually serve a business purpose before you do it, because there, you know, th there is some discomfort related to the test, and there's certainly a cost involved. So be sure that you're getting the value that you think you're getting by uh, by testing your employees. In all, and I, I'm not really aware of uh, too many employers that are actually doing testing anymore. Uh, as a condition for coming to the workplace, but that doesn't mean that there aren't some out there still doing it. Um, employees have to give informed consent to the testing. What that means under this guidance is that the employer has to tell employees whether a positive result or whether a declination to participate would result in, in something happening to them that is exclusion from the, from the workplace. So if you're gonna require the testing, you gotta, t you gotta disclose to people what that means. And, you should, and uh, I would tell you that you should do that in writing. 
So personal protective equipment, um, you know, in general, especially in a, you know, the bigger you are, the more important this is. Uh, people are still being uh, asked to, to wear masks in the, even in an office environment, in a big office environment. Um, so, but PPE beyond um, mask wearing, uh, beyond the mask that people bring with them to work every day, um, especially in a production or a, a warehouse environment, this comes up pretty regularly and, and the issues come up in our practice, you know, asking the question of, you know, can employees require N95 masks or something, something beyond whatever the employer has decided to give them. You know, certainly earlier on in the pandemic, uh, it was difficult to get PPE. So this is probably more of an issue, uh, you know, six or nine months ago than it is today, but nevertheless, it still comes up. It also comes up in the, in the context of how often employers are gonna replace uh, replace the PPE, especially when it comes to face masks being used in a dirty environment, like in a production environment. So uh, I think that the rule of thumb here for an, for an employer is, I wouldn't, uh, I would tell you not to skimp, you know, provide something that fits well, that, uh, that actually does protect people uh, in the environment that they're working in, but not everybody needs an N95. In fact, uh, you know, outside uh, the met, you know, outside medical and first responders, I would tell you that there are not not very many people at all that would require something as serious as an N95. Um, but again, don't skip. Make sure that you give people things that actually work, that stay on their face, or or protect you know protect their faces um, and uh, and replace them as necessary. Don't require people to uh, to wear dirty masks all day long just because they're a little expensive if you can. But the standards uh, that OSHA has uh, published or here on the slide, it's the, it's the same OSHA standard uh, that applied before the pandemic. That is the employer gets to make the determination about what uh, PPE they'll give under the circumstances. The hottest topic lately has been COVID-19 uh, vaccinations, you know, and I, I wrote what's the plan because the plan is gonna be different for each uh, employer. Uh, so some questions that have come up, can you mandate a vaccination program? Um, should you? Um, so what we've told, uh, well, we're going to we'll flip to the next slide on this, but some advice is, uh, I, I've told him, I've told uh, clients that the place you start from is asking the question about why are we mandating or why would we mandate a, a vaccination program? Why would we require all our people to get vaccinated? You know, I, I hope that you're, uh, you've been able to operate uh, your business successfully since uh, the pandemic started, uh, even in a production environment or in a warehouse. So if you've been able to do it successfully up to now, um, I, I guess I would raise the question of, do you actually have a business need to start vaccinating everybody or mandate it? Um, and the answer is gonna differ co uh, company to company, but the place you ought to start from if you're really interested in getting your employees vaccinated is, to promote it and encourage it as best you can with leaders in your company going first. I would also tell you too, based on how the states have rolled out uh, the vaccines that this is more of an academic discussion than a practical one because uh, virtually every state that I know is prioritizing people on uh, based on their physical characteristics like their age or their physical condition. Uh, and in some cases based on their profession. So. You could talk all day long about whether you're going to mandate everybody to get vaccinated, but whether they're actually going to have access to a vaccination will depend on factors outside your workplace in most cases. So with that in mind, though, if you're going to require or even promote uh, your employees get the vac vaccines, do what you can to make it available. Uh, there are some states like Maryland that are making, uh, uh, you know, maybe focusing on employer wide uh, programs or making them available at certain employer sites. If you live in a place that that is available, uh, take advantage of it. You may think about funding it as well, um, making sure that people can afford it and uh, that there's no charges, um, you know, no charges that would be assessed against an individual employee. What I'm also seeing at the state level, by the way, is that uh, you're either, if you don't have insurance, uh, medical insurance, it looks like the states in many cases are picking up the tab and not being, not asking uh, citizens to either pay co-pays or, uh, or, uh, you know, the underlying charge if you don't have insurance. But again, if it, you wouldn't want your employees uh, to have to pay for it if you're gonna mandate or, or strongly suggest it. And making sure that your motives and uh, making sure that your motives are, solid, motives are solid and, you know, you may think about non-discriminatory incentives as well. Um, 
making sure that uh, you know if you're going to offer people some sort of a uh, a carrot to go get vaccinated that you do so on a non-discriminatory a non-discriminatory basis what does that mean it means that you got to make uh, you got to make uh, make it make uh, these incentives available uh, in some cases to folks who can't get vaccinated because of a legitimate uh, medical issue or some other religious exemption so keep those in mind so what I would tell you is if you're going to consider a an incentive program, making sure that you clear it with your attorney so that it's non-discriminatory. And there's actually a CDC toolkit for this, uh, you know, for rolling out uh, vaccinations uh, to essential workers. So if you decide that you're going to mandate the program, mandate a vaccination program, uh, you have what you have to do is uh, prom, uh, is include some measures in the program to account for religious exemptions and uh, medical exemptions. So people that are unable to, or feel like they're unable to get uh, vaccinated because they've got an underlying physical condition like a sensitivity to vaccines, or they've got a religious exemption, you have to provide uh, for a process to review those exemption requests and decide them in a non-discriminatory way. So again, what, what I would tell you is that having a, having a program sounds good, but actually administering it in a way that's not gonna get you in trouble with the EEOC may prove to be difficult for many, uh, for many employers. I also found this. Uh, uh, I also found it interesting that um, I want to just jump ahead to this slide. Is that there was a survey done by Gartner uh, last month, which which found that uh, which found that a majority of employers, seventy one percent, would encourage their employees to get vaccinated, but not actually require it. I think this is sort of indicative of what I'm talking about. Is that um, it definitely makes sense to encourage it, but mandating it, uh, not so much in many cases, you know, outside the healthcare environment or the uh, the first responder environment. Uh, I think it's gonna be more tr trouble than it's worth in many cases uh, to actually mandate it. I just wanna go back to the prior slide that I skipped over for a minute. So just a, a couple of things you ought to keep in mind from, this, uh, first, uh, from the recent guidance from the EEOC. So actually, uh, it, you know, if you were to mandate vaccines, it's not a medical exam, so the ADA analysis is not required. Um, at will employees, you could require again. You could require uh, vaccines because chances are your employees are at will, so this could be part of their uh, part of a safety program or part of a uh, just a general condition of employment. If you find yourself in a union environment, by the way, you should look at your uh, your collective bargaining agreement as well as uh, coordinate with your uh, with your union uh, just to be sure. Uh, that you're not going to uh, uh, cause any grievances as a result of such a program. And the, the one issue that I don't know and can't answer today is whether there would be any employer liability uh, for requiring the vaccine. So just by way of background, what you're concerned about as an employee is, number one, hurting your employees. But you know beyond that issue is creating liability for the company that would not be covered by workers' compensation. Generally, if somebody gets hurt at work, uh, they're covered by workers' comp and they're eligible for benefits. But what we don't know is whether an employer who requires these particular vaccines, again, which were uh, passed and approved under emergency youth authorizations, whether whether that might create liability for the employer that goes beyond workers' compensation. So it's, it's an unanswered question that I, that I would worry about a little bit uh, and which would make me think twice about mandating a program. Liability waivers is an issue that's come up uh, quite a bit in the last couple of months for us as well. This idea of, you know, if I'm going to require my people to come back to to, the, to work, should I should I ask them to sign a written waiver, or if I'm going to have uh, visitors to my to my office, should I have them sign written waivers? Um, so I, I can't tell you that there's any case law on this issue in the COVID-19 context, but I am seeing them pop up in commercial real estate, especially in New York City where the, the landlords and the management companies are requiring these waivers to be signed as a condition for entering their buildings. So they're really untested right now. Uh, I don't think that I have not seen any case law on the issue or any court come out on the issue. My guess is though that uh, you would be able to enforce a, a waiver as to visitors or to vendors that come on site in your workplace. But actually uh, enforcing a waiver like that against your employee population, I think is probably unlikely to be successful. So if you've got such a concern about liability uh, as it applies to your employees, I would think twice about making them come back to work. If the only thing you, uh, the only way you think you think you can manage it is to have it, have them sign written waivers. 
I don't think it's going to be successful. That's just my bet based on experience. But if you do decide you're going to use a waiver in either context, here are some of the things you ought to keep in mind. Have it in writing, follow the law and the CDC guidelines, um, implement a safety program that fits your particular workplace, and then have it in writing. I think it's going to be required in, uh, in virtually every situation. Anti-retaliation and whistleblowers is, is, is probably uh, a big concern, I think, for employers in, in the, the context of the liability that comes out of the pandemic. Uh, I know from some statistics, at least in the state of New Jersey, that about uh, more than 80% of the employment-related litigations filed in state court since last March are whistleblower claims. Why are they interesting uh, in New Jersey and other places is because there's punitive damages and attorney's fees that can be awarded to a successful plaintiff. And also, too, um, that seems to be the flavor of the day when it comes to employment cases, thanks to how people are getting terminated, unfortunately. So there is definitely an increase of uh, an increased concern there uh, from a liability standpoint. How do you manage it? Uh, I think in most cases, the risk of uh, whistleblowing lies in how you handle it, meaning that how you treat employees, how you keep them informed uh, and how you manage their complaints uh, is going to determine whether you create a, a whistleblower risk in your company. So going back to the earlier slide, making sure that you're investigating complaints, communicating well with your employees, uh, that's going to go a long way to, to uh, basically disposing of these uh, whistleblower concerns. And have a strong anti-retaliation policy and make sure that you're also walking the talk, not just, uh, not just uh, having a, a paper policy. Encourage your employees to uh, to report and manage those claims in a, in a meaningful way. And making sure, again, as I said before, that you circle back and advise employees how you, uh, you know, the conclusions that you reached in the context of your investigation. This is old news, you know, what happened, I think, but it, but it's, uh, it's still important because some of the standards continue to, to evolve. You know, when an employee gets COVID-19, hopefully they're, they're not in the workplace when they get it, but if they are, uh, sending them home immediately uh, requiring that they quarantine for at least seven to 10 days under the current guidance, um, encourage them to get tested, uh, contract, uh, this should be contact trace, that is notify anybody who is potentially exposed to the coworkers. That means, that means coworkers that were, uh, substantially exposed to them that were not just passed them by in the hall, but, but spent at least about 15 minutes with them in their presence. In addition to contact tracing, vacating the impacted area, uh, determine a work to return to work date based on your state quarantine requirements and the CDC, CDC guidelines is important. Again, it's going to be about seven to 10 days, depending on whether they actually have a negative test as well. Testing is uh, an interesting topic here too, because if somebody actually does get COVID and test negative, uh, I'm sorry, test positive, they may not test negative for several months afterwards. So what, what you do here is make sure that their symptoms are resolved, that they've quarantined for at least seven to 10 days, uh, before they can return to work. And then th and, and they do not have any more symptoms when they come back to work. Whether you're going to have to record the infection and report to OSHA is going to be determined a bit on the circumstances. You know, somebody who got, somebody who shows up to work sick is not necessarily a reportable case. Somebody who uh, was exposed to a positive person in the workplace and later showed up positive or symptomatic, that's probably going to be a, a reportable case. But this is something that you should... Uh, Definitely, uh, definitely consult your attorney about before you report. Paid sick leave, we'll, we'll kind of uh, go quickly through this, but just keep in mind that uh, the FFCRA is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act had mandatory uh, paid sick leave last year that expired at the end of December. Um, it's voluntary thereafter, which means that you as an employer can determine uh, whether you want to extend uh, the paid sick leave which goes beyond state sick leave, by the way, uh, it's voluntary. And if you decide to do it, you can take the credits on a quarterly basis on your tax returns, but it is voluntary. So the employer can decide. Just about uh, sick leave, know what your state requirements are. Um, in, in the name of flexibility, many employers are extending uh, other accrued PTO uh, for sick employees that need to take time off for COVID. That's not a bad thing to do as well. Uh, telemedicine visits, uh, just a quick pointer here. This is new guidance that came out recently. Uh, telemedicine visits are eligible for FMLA leave. This would be intermittent leave or short leave, obviously. 
uh, so long as they meet these requirements. They basically have to be an exam on video conference and permitted by state law. And you can actually still require the employee to get a, a doctor's note that they actually did it and what, you know, uh, and that, that they attended if you want. What happens in terms of your return to work after getting COVID-19? We covered this a little bit before, uh, or some of it anyway. Uh, COVID-19, just the diagnosis, by the way, uh, is, it a, is it a diagnosis or is the diagnosis a disability under the ADA is a question that's come up. Uh, I think the answer there is that just getting COVID is not a disability unto itself. But, if you, but what we do know is that COVID may cause a number of conditions that could be disabilities. So somebody who's uh, got it and is asymptomatic or does not have any lingering symptoms or lingering uh, disabilities uh, is probably not eligible for ADA protection unless they've got other, other conditions which uh, lend themselves to a disability determination. Um, I, I would tell you for somebody who was COVID-19 positive or, and or symptomatic, uh, medical exams and certifications are probably not so helpful. So requiring them to go get certified by a doctor before they come back to the office is not so helpful. I mean, uh, what you should do is just follow the quarantine uh, rules. Antibody testing is not permitted, by the way, um, as a condition for return to work, because it's not really even diagnostic of anything uh, that's important to the employer. You may, as I said, have to provide some accommodations for lingering effects. And for that, you would go through your usual disability analysis. Um, so, and then just to, uh, in, you know, applying these rules uh, in a non-discriminatory way is very, very important as you can imagine. And I think this is not so much an issue anymore, but it was an issue last year in a number of cases, you know, terminating based on a COVID-19 diagnosis you obviously wouldn't want to do that. I don't think it's so much an issue now that we understand more about the pandemic, but just keep it in mind to, to be sure you could justify terminations in this environment before you do them. And, and you know, uh, you can justify them on a non-discriminatory basis. Last but not least is confidentiality and cybersecurity. Um, I've seen some crazy uh, statistics about the uptick in phishing attempts and malware and all kinds of nasty things that uh, are facing employees who are uh, working in a remote environment where their computers are under attack, their networks, uh, and people find themselves pretty tense, pretty nervous. And I think uh, maybe even they let their guard down because they're working in an environment that's not really uh, an office or a workplace anymore. So it, it, that's a situation that's ripe for problems. And we've seen it, uh, uh, we've seen the statistics bear that out. So what I would what I would caution everybody to do is making sure that you don't let your guard down, that you provide training to your employees, uh, send them example phishing emails, keep them updated about what they need to do from a cybersecurity per, uh, perspective, and avoid any risky workarounds of your system just to get work done. Give them the tools that they need. Make sure they understand that they shouldn't be uh, trying to work around your your uh, your malware. Uh, software or your uh, or your antivirus software to get stuff done, or in some cases, uh, they shouldn't be using their own personal devices that are not protected as well to do company business. Making sure they have the tools uh, that they need is important. Monitoring them uh, and do what you can and uh, do is do whatever you can to protect trade secrets. You know, remind people to shred documents, give them secure places to save their data. All of these things are really really important uh, when you're dealing with these hybrid. Uh, when you're dealing with hybrid environments. So uh, making sure that your IT people are up to the task, very, very important for sure. So that concludes the slides. I wanna to go, to uh, to go to the chat and make sure that we've, uh, uh, we've got a couple of questions here. Uh, what I'll do by the way is uh, we'll make these, uh, these slides available to anybody who wants them. Um, the home office expense I'm sorry, the list of states that had uh, that have uh, requirements for uh, home office expenses. I'm not sure that that was an exhaustive list, by the way. Um, I'll see if I can find my, my notes to be sure we don't miss any as we go. California is the is probably the most cited one, uh, by the way, but I'll uh, I'll respond to that question uh, af uh, after the presentation. And then uh, someone reminded me about uh, quarantining after travel. You know, that's something that, that, that I probably should have talked about a little bit today. Um, 
the idea, what about have what what about employers who are furloughing employees that test positive for COVID and are forced to quarantine due to exposure or travel? That's an interesting one. So, I would I would just I would distinguish first of all between business travel and personal travel. If you're going to require somebody to to travel for business and then they're required to quarantine when they when they return home, it would it would seem to me to be a bit unfair. Uh, to, to not pay them for the time of the furlough because you created the situation that required them to be quarantined. On the other hand, despite the fact that we, uh, we don't want to be too intrusive into people's lives, if people travel voluntarily for vacation or family reasons and have to quarantine when they get back, uh, they're not eligible to be paid for that time unless they've got, uh, unless they've got accrued pay time off or are you out of the goodness of your heart uh, allow them to uh, to work from home and get paid, or just pay them. So the answer there is, if you're if you're requiring to travel for business, I would I would uh, I would be prepared to pay people for the quarantine period and not furlough them. On the other hand, if people are uh, people are uh, can't perform their job from home and don't have any accrued PTO, you could feel free to furlough them uh, during the time that they have to quarantine because of uh, state quarantine rules. Well, listen. I really appreciate everybody's involvement today, and, and some really uh, some really insightful questions as well. Uh, just to sum it up, I mean, as you can see, this is a pretty complicated bunch of information in today's presentation, and, and it really faces every single employer, whether you have two employees or two hundred or more. So, I would tell you that uh, making sure that you're that you're fully versed in these things before you create your return to work plan is really important. Um, and as as you've seen, they're very complex for sure. So. I would invite anybody who uh, participated today to just give us a call. Don't, don't worry about getting charged or anything, but raise any questions that you have and we'll help you uh, come up with those return to work plans as best we can. So that concludes today's program. Again, thank you very much for attending and we look forward to staying in touch uh, after the presentation.